Welcome to The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. People from around the world, all races, creeds, religions, from across all socioeconomic backgrounds are reporting being taken aboard some sort of spacecraft against their will. They're unable to move or speak or resist. In some cases, they report being subjected to horrific experimentation by strange looking beings with long limbs, black almond shaped eyes. These creatures seem indifferent to their suffering of their captives. Victims then report returning to the location from which they were taken and left emotionally shaken, sometimes permanently scarred physically and psychologically. Sometimes they have no recollection of the traumatic event and only discover years later under hypnosis what happened. On this episode of The Conspiracy Show, we investigate the alien abduction phenomenon. We're about to meet the man at the center of one of the most famous abduction cases in history. His story would be turned into a Hollywood motion picture. We'll also meet another alleged victim of abduction who claims multiple abductions when he was a child. And we'll meet an abduction researcher who has worked with thousands of alleged abductees under hypnosis. Of course, we'll also speak to a skeptic who believes the phenomenon has a perfectly rational scientific explanation. Me? Well, I just want the truth and I'm willing to follow it wherever it may lead. It is time to redefine reality. Genetic enigma or a human alien hybrid. That's how cynical I am about the process. Is it possible technology can alter weather patterns? Or is it going to make it? Has been engineered by the Illuminati? There's no doubt. I'm here in Arizona with Travis Walton, who was at the center of what is considered to be one of the most credible alien abduction cases. He is the author of Fire in the Sky, The Walton Experience. Travis, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. Good to be with you. Take us back to November 5th, 1975. What were you doing at that time and uh, what happened on that day? Well, I was working in the woods with a crew of six other men. We just finished a hard day's work and uh, it was starting to get dark and uh, we loaded up our equipment and headed out. And we hadn't gone very far when we noticed a strange light coming through the trees. And uh, when we finally got where we could see the source of the light, we saw this metallic disc hovering there, outlined against the sky. It was just unmistakable. It was less than 100 feet away. And uh, I got out and, and went up to get a closer look. What compelled you, Travis, to get out of the truck and actually approach this strange light? Well, some of the other crew guys uh, still think that it looked to them like I was in some kind of a trance, like I was being drawn towards it, but I didn't feel like I was under any outside control at all. To me, I was just curious to see it up close. It was really awesome uh, to, to behold. It was uh, glowing. The whole area was lit up with a very strange, sort of a light that changed the color of everything. And the object itself was, part of it was metallic and part of it was glowing, but the whole thing was one smooth surface like it was made out of glass or something. The closer I got, the scareder I got, and they were getting pretty anxious and they were, you know, yelling at me to get away from there. And when I got right up to it and was looking up at it, it suddenly got uh, louder and started to move. And as soon as I raised up, I just felt this electric shock go through my body, like I'd been hit and didn't see it coming. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was waking up, and at first I thought I was in a hospital, but when I finally got where I could focus my eyes, I saw that these weren't uh, medical personnel around me, that, that there, there was these creatures standing over me. And I, I just flipped out. I just, I just really became uh, sort of, crazy with fear and uh, I was thinking of fighting my way past them and getting out of there but they suddenly left the room and so I, I went looking for a way out. It is somewhere between 12 and 15 million potential abductees. It's absolutely crazy. I'm here near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with Dr. David Jacobs, alien abduction researcher. David, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. Thank you, Richard, for having me. Have you been able to put together 
uh, say, a list of, of commonalities that sort of underlie all of these abduction cases? Most abductions have a certain commonalities. If, if there were no commonalities, uh, I would not be an abduction researcher. People say that they're taken out of their normal environment, which might be their bed, which might be their car, which might be their kitchen or their living room or whatever it is, but it won't be their workplace usually. And uh, they're usually abducted when they're gonna be missed the least. And that's usually when they're alone. They're brought on board a UFO, either they're floated up usually into this object. They are passive. Their jaws are slack, their eyes are glassy. Uh, they can't run, they can't swing and hit somebody or anything like that, they can't resist. It is somewhere between 12 and 15 million potential abductees. It's absolutely crazy. Well, in the Walton case, if it looks like a hoax, has the characteristics of a hoax, and is crying out, hoax, hoax, maybe it's a hoax. Walton is seeing the classic type of UFO that's evolved, the sort of saucer-shaped. And besides, there's, I think it was a $5,000 offer from National Enquirer for the best, the best uh, UFO tale or something. And so, hey, this, this could have sounded very good to some good old boys. What do you make of the Travis Walton abduction case? Well, I think that the Travis Walton abduction case is a very, very good case. Travis Walton is a very intelligent, very thoughtful, very well-spoken person. I, I like that case. In the beginning, I thought it was a hoax, but not now. So November 10th, 1975, you suddenly reappear. Take me back to that day. Well, I looked around and I found myself, uh, you know, standing in the middle of the uh, uh, dark. Uh, but I could see the lights of Heber down below. That's the town nearest where this happened. So I ran down in there, found a phone booth, and called my brother-in-law, but he thought it was some another practical joke, you know, a prank call. Apparently the family had been receiving a lot of them. In the first few minutes of conversation, it came out that they, uh, you know, I, I was thinking that it was still the same night. I didn't know that f uh, five days had gone by. And uh, my brother said, feel, feel your face. And I had this five day growth of beard and I looked at my watch and the date had changed. And so that was quite a shock. All the evidence, if you look at the pieces of the evidence, nothing about what he says or what he did really is very convincing. First of all, he had told his, his mother, if you ever hear of me being abducted by aliens, don't worry about it. Um, he was missing for about five days, and uh, the local police thought it was a hoax, and they thought his mother uh, knew something about it because she was um, not that upset when she heard that Travis had been abducted by aliens. The law enforcement authorities immediately suspected that the rest of the Woods crew were making up a cover story that they'd probably murdered me and uh, hidden the body and, and were trying to explain why nobody was going to see me again. The men volunteered to take the lie detector test and the sheriff set up a polygraph. When the men passed, they, they had to come up with another theory. We were told there were a couple of polygraph exams that Walton had passed, but then we find out later that he there had been an earlier one we hadn't heard about, and he failed that one so badly that the polygraph examiner said he was even, not only failed the test, he was practicing deceptive tactics, like trying to hold or, or alter his breathing. It was just one thing after another, trying to explain it away, trying to say that um, it was uh, alcohol or drug hallucination or a transitory psychosis, but you know, uh, there's been a lot of medical testing that disproves that there was any drugs involved. I took psychological exams that proved that there was no, no um, uh, mental abnormalities at all. People just didn't want to accept it, and uh, anybody that, uh, uh, from a skeptical point of view, that had some uh, theory, however unsupported, uh, kind of got some attention in the media back then. I believe. Walton was tested for about the fourth time, something like that, in 2009, and failed again for a TV show. Well, I mean, I don't want to make too much of that, but, but for those who say, oh, you know, he passed the polygraph, I'm saying, well, not all the time. There was a lie detector test given to him very early on through the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization uh, that he did not do well on. Then he's, I don't know how many lie detector tests he's taken since then that he's passed. The point is, is that there were like five other witnesses, I guess, and they all saw a UFO strike him with a light. 
they all passed uh, lie detector tests. And there was one guy who was brand new who didn't really know them all that much. Uh, and uh, the other ones, they had squabbles between each other, but they all maintained uh, the, the, uh, that they were the truthfulness of, of what they had seen. I remember being in the arms of a tall, white, gray-type creature. The head was very large. The eyes were very large with black eyes, and I could only move my eyes, and I could not scream. Paul Shishis is an alien abductee. Paul, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. Thank you for having me here today, Richard. When did it all start? Oh, well, uh, I had childhood nightmares at age uh, four to six, uh, which I believe were dreams. I found out at age 44, uh, from a newspaper article confirmed there were UFOs over Scarborough at that time. It sort of connected me to why I was seeing all these UFOs uh, throughout my life. It begins in infancy, and we know that because parents are abducted with their babies sometimes. And it continues into old age, and it happens with great frequency. How often did this happen to you? Uh, they, they seem to happen almost, to me as a child, uh, almost nightly and they search all their lives uh, for a whole series of events that uh, they might have strange reactions to over the course of time since they were children. Tell me about these encounters, these contacts uh, that you thought were dreams. What did you see? I remember being in the arms of a tall, white, gray-type creature. The head was very large. The eyes were very large with black eyes, and I could only move my eyes and I could not scream. You get this sense of being paralyzed. It's actually called sleep paralysis because the body is still asleep. It's out of sync, and yet you're in this dreamlike state. And we can trace this phenomenon back to the Middle Ages when people believed in demons and they woke to see an incubus or a succubus pressing down on their body, holding them down, hence the paralysis. They're hallucinating an explanation for what's happening to their body. What would you say to a skeptic who might suggest that what you were experiencing as a child was a phenomenon known as sleep paralysis? Well, uh, does sleep paralysis generate sound? because I do remember hearing sound of my parents snoring. The light I described earlier, I do remember hearing a sound uh, when it was moving closer to me. So there was sound associated. And of course, uh, you know, how will you ever prove that this really happened because of so many years? And as I say, to actually find out that Scarborough had sightings uh, back in 1965 that I discovered uh, from the Star Archives of Toronto newspaper that this confirmed to me there was in fact something going on. Uh, in memory of my class in grade one, uh, certain kids, my friends, had bleeding noses a lot. So there may have been a program going on in my neighborhood, period. Other abductions of yes. other children? Yes. Uh, these are sane and normal people. This is not a mental disorder. They're not psychotic. They're sane and normal. But they're different. They're within, um, they're, they're over at one end of the spectrum of highly imaginative, quite able to imagine things, and they often have very vivid dreams. Uh, they, uh, they're easily hypnotized. This is a very important point, even self-hypnotizable. A person who knows what they're doing using hypnosis can put them into place a series of protocols which will prevent uh, uh, having everything taken at face value, whether it's remembered consciously or not. The main thing that was accomplished by the, uh, the hypnosis was uh, to calm uh, me down and separate the um, fear from the memories. In 1986, I began to do my own hypnotic regressions. Hypnosis is just relaxation and focusing in. And uh, the first thing you do, of course, is if you've never heard uh, testimony before, if something sounds like just very, very strange, you put it on the back burner, you wait for other people to say the same thing, and, uh, and the more people you have saying the same thing, the stronger the evidence becomes. Most of the cases are not hoaxes. There are exceptions, of course. Most of the people appear to be what are called fantasy-prone individuals. Now, to go through the looking glass and take up the position 
with, uh, with Travis Walton. We have lots of evidence, but none of it's very good. It's all anecdotes and dreams and psychological states and the Travis Walton case, which is, I think, too good to be true. So you have to buy into that. Then you have to believe that the aliens had some reason to pick out Travis and to keep him for some time and, and that the aliens look just like we've imagined them to look and their craft look just like we've imagined them to look. These all can be shown to be sort of evolved things that show up now in our comic books. So any way we look at it, the Travis Walton case, I think, cannot be distinguished from a hoax. In interview after interview, they leave out the fact that there was these other types of beings in there. What do you think they want, whoever they are? Uh, I believe they're interested in uh, certain uh, genetic genes that we carry. Uh, I believe that uh, we could be, all of us, the human race right now, could be under one big hybrid program. Uh, in my analysis of today of what I've researched, uh, this seems to white, might be the case of uh, changing the species as maybe what had happened with Neanderthals. You know, I, I've done so many interviews about this, and it's kind of curious that in interview after interview, uh, they leave out the fact that there was these other types of beings in there. I took them to be human rescuers at first. I hope it's positive. I hope it's wonderful. I hope they're here to cure cancer and stop war. I hope they're here to bring us into the community of uh, planets, and, their, uh, and I want to be an ambassador and all that sort of stuff. I hope that's true. That would be wonderful. Uh, that's not what people tell me. Years ago, I began to hear accounts that were of um, people being taken into rooms and looking at uh, items on a screen. Normal scenes of everyday human life. They're standing there with an alien or a hybrid, and they hear in their minds, because all communication is telepathic on board these objects, can you tell the difference between you and us? What do you mean, difference? Everybody looks the same to me. They'll hear, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? Soon we will all be happy. Soon everybody will know his place. Now, the first time I heard that, you just dismiss it. Maybe it's confabulation, whatever it is. But then I began to hear it again and again and again and again. People would say, aliens say to them, soon we'll all be together. People would see these images of uh, different things, so they were supposed to pick out the hybrids, basically, from the humans. And I began to realize, as this evidence began to pile up, that soon we would all be together, just like they were saying. Look at the whole setting of it. I mean, let's just look at the Walton case, just step back a little bit from belief or disbelief and just objectively look at it. What do we have? We have Travis Walton, who has record for having uh, burgled and, and forged stolen checks. And so we have a guy who I'm not saying he's all bad or he can't tell the truth, but that's what we're starting with. And he shows up with this case, this alien encounter, just two weeks after the made-for-TV movie featuring the Betty and Barney Hill case in 1975 with James Earl Jones and Estella Parsons. The Travis Walton case became the subject of the 1993 film Fire in the Sky. It is often described by researchers as the best documented case of alien abduction ever recorded. But in the absence of any concrete evidence and contradictory lie detector test results, I remain unconvinced the Walton case was a genuine alien abduction. Our other alleged abductee seems very sincere, but again, a total absence of concrete evidence makes it most impossible to evaluate this case. However, I don't believe that every case can be explained away as a hoax, the overactive imagination of fantasy-prone individuals, or a condition known as sleep paralysis. In 1991, David Jacobs, along with the late Bud Hopkins and sociologist Dr. Ron Westrom, commissioned a Roper poll in order to determine how many Americans might have experienced the abduction phenomenon. Of nearly 6,000 Americans polled, 119 answered in a way that Hopkins, Jacobs, and Westrom interpreted as supporting their ET interpretation of the abduction phenomenon. 
Based on this figure, they estimated that nearly four million Americans may have been abducted by extraterrestrials. If we were to extrapolate that data, the worldwide figure would be nearly 100 million possible alien abductees. Let's suppose that only one-tenth of one percent of those respondents actually experienced something that could be not otherwise explained away as fantasy or some underlying psychological or neurological condition. That would be 10,000 cases in America alone. Something is going on. The answer could be extraterrestrial. It could be demonic. It could be some sort of psychological warfare experiment where victims are drugged or hypnotized and implanted with false memories. Regardless, something real is behind the alien abduction phenomenon. And I pray it doesn't happen to you. And now, I'd like to know what you think. You can contact me here at The Conspiracy Show through our website, www.theconspiracyshow.com. In the meantime, don't be afraid.